A woman called Golda. The story so far. Golda, the cigarette. What's the matter? You're afraid I'll die young. The children, we're almost there. In 1977, Golda Meir returned to her grammar school in Milwaukee. We welcome to the Fourth Street School our most distinguished graduate, Mrs. Golda Meir. How shall I describe her? To people all over the world, she was one of the great women of this century. Some say she was the greatest. It's hard for me to judge. To me, she was my longtime dear friend. This is the dream I've had. Ever since I was a little girl in Russia, frightened for my life. The dream that we can have the same peace and security other people have. The only way we're ever going to get it is in a Jewish homeland. If I won't go, you won't marry me. I'd love to marry you, Morris. I was thinking of a baby. I didn't hear that. I'm saying I think we should have a child. Really? When did the committee tell you we could go to work on this child? You are a very capable person. Whatever you do, you do well. So, we want you to be a delegate to the Histadrut. Me? Oh, no, Ariel. I couldn't. I don't want to spend the rest of my life feeling sick and useless. Where will you go? It's up to you. If you come with me, I'll stay in Palestine. If not, I'll go back to America. So, we left the kibbutz, which I was very unhappy about. And we went to live in Jerusalem. And the years passed. Uh, Morris became a bookkeeper, and I became the mother of two children. You're not working? Well, I wouldn't call bringing up two small children exactly loafing. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it anything very much, considering how badly we need your capabilities. He's got some hell of a nerve. Trying to talk you into Tel Aviv when I work in Jerusalem. He didn't have to try very hard. I took the job, Morris. In the years following the separation from Morris, Golda was intensely involved in Israel's struggle for independence. One whole year! You're trying to say somebody who came last week should go ahead of me. If I'll stay much longer, I'll die here. No, no, we're trying to get you all off, but the children first. On May 15th, the British will pull out. Two, the Arabs will invade. What is the present strength of the Haganah? A hundred thousand able-bodied soldiers. And on the other side? Four hundred thousand Arab soldiers. If you could keep Abdallah out of the war, it might save us. We must have our old state, and the time is now. And if the only way we can have it is to go to war, we'll go to war. And we'll beat you. If there is a war, it will be her fault. All. Her fault! Because she's a stubborn, arrogant, Damned woman. On this night, I could only think about the Arab Legion joining four other armies against us. I said to myself, I failed. There will be war. In a moment, a woman called Golda continues. By the middle of February, Arab guerrilla attacks had already started. In four months, the British were scheduled to leave, and the Arab countries were certain to invade us. We needed arms. According to Ben Gurion, to equip a Jewish army would require $25 million. There's only one country in the world in which we can raise so much money in so little time. I'm going to the United States immediately. I must make our American friends understand how serious the situation is. Excuse me, PG. 
I'm sorry to interrupt, but you can't possibly leave at a time like this. Look, what you are doing here, I can't do, but I might be able to do what you want to do in America. What makes you think that you can raise this kind of money? Two reasons. I speak the language. So do I. And the other? I'm American. No, this is too important. Let us put it to a vote. A vote? Are you calling a vote to overrule me? Why not? We are founding the only democracy in the Middle East. In a democracy, the majority rules. Those in favor of sending Golda. Opposed? None. Golda goes. No. Democracy. here next day. You could buy one here. Probably, but Ben-Gurion insists that I take the plane this afternoon. Why? <laughs> I think he's trying to get even with me. What a life. We don't even have time for ourselves, let alone for each other. Well, maybe when I'll get back. I probably won't be here. Really? Where are you going? Wilson? Wilson? What's that? There's very good beer in Pilsen. Pilsen beer is famous. Well, yeah, what is this? You're not going to Czechoslovakia to drink beer. But I'm, I'm leaving right away. Now, Ariel, please tell me. Well, you know that we have been trying to put together an air force for the Hagen Art. Uh -huh. Hood has managed to buy some Messerschmitt 109 fighter planes. Well. What is in Pilsen besides beer is the Skoda munitions factory. They made Messerschmitts for the Germans. And I am going there to hire aircraft mechanics. Well, of course, I know the Czech government has been selling us arms, but the situation is very unstable there now. By the time you get there, the Soviet Union could be running things. And I wouldn't trust those fellows to be any friends of ours. How do you know? They would even let a Jewish agent into the country. I don't. And I certainly don't have time to be held up at the border while they bury me in red tape. So, do you have an answer for that? Well, I uh, will parachute in. No, no, don't do it, Ariel. No, please forget the whole idea. It's all wrong for you. Why is it wrong for me? Because, because you're too badly needed here. Let someone else go. I am one of the very few people who can speak the language. Mm. Oh, oh. For hiring mechanics, any businessman would do better. And how many businessmen do you think we have with parachute training? Hmm? The trading is one thing. This is different. What is different? We'll never see each other again. Do you really think that you can talk me out of going? Not for a minute. You have to understand, Mrs. Myerson, this is not a Zionist organization. Some of these people, maybe a lot of them, are just not interested in Palestine. And all of them are sick and tired of hearing how badly we need money. Yeah. Well, frankly, they're under pressure to raise funds for institutions in America. Jewish hospitals, Jewish charities all over the country, they need money too. It might be better if you didn't address this group, Mrs. Myerson. Wait, and let us set up a more favorable audience. No, I have to get through to these people. Well then, it might be a good idea if 
if you let me take a look at your speech. I haven't prepared a speech. You mean you don't know what you're going to say? I'll know when the time comes to say it. Please believe me when I tell you I did not come to the United States only because 700,000 Jews are in danger of being killed. That is not the issue. The issue is that if the Jews of Palestine survive, then the Jews of the world survive with them. And their freedom will be assured forever. But if these 700,000 are wiped off the face of the earth, then there'll be no Jewish people as such. And for centuries to come, all our hopes and dreams of a Jewish nation, a Jewish homeland, will be smashed. My friends, when I say that we need money immediately, I don't mean next week. I mean right now. In less than four months, we'll be fighting for our lives against cannon and armor. It is not for you to decide whether we'll fight. That decision is taken. We will fight. We'll pay for the birth of our nation with our blood. That is normal. The best of us will fall, that is certain. There is only one thing for you to decide, whether we'll win or we'll lose. Golda raised not $25 million. She raised 50. The money went directly to the capitals of the world where Ben Gurion had sent agents to purchase arms for the Haganah. And in a converted museum, one day before the scheduled pullout, an historic event. Exiles from the land of Israel, the Jewish people have returned believing in their self-evident right to be a nation like all other nations in their own sovereign state. I imagine every people that declares its independence goes through difficulties. But for us, there was such deadly danger that some of our friends strongly advised us not to proclaim independence. But we were determined to do it anyway. By virtue of this right, and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called Israel. The next day, May 15th, right on schedule, Israel was invaded by the armies of six countries. Weapons bought with the money Golda had raised began to arrive in chartered ships. Rifles, hand grenades, artillery pieces. One of the first ships brought 10 Messerschmitt fighter planes and aircraft mechanics from Czechoslovakia. In a few more days, the Arabs were being driven back or contained on all fronts. And with her work done, Golda flew home from America. Hello, Golda. I'm going to make a speech. It will be short, so don't expect much. All right, PJ. <laughs> One day. 
When history is written, it will be recorded there was a woman who made it possible for the Jewish state to be born. In the United Nations General Assembly, the Arab countries now accepted a proposal for a ceasefire. It left Israel with some gains over the partition plan, but it divided Jerusalem with the old city in Jordanian hands. And despite the UN agreement, for the next 19 years, Jews were denied access to their holiest site, the Western Wall of Solomon's Temple. And the problem of the Palestinian refugees was created. I'm sure some Palestinian Arabs fled because they were frightened. But many left because their leaders told them to, promising that after we were driven into the sea, they would come back and take over Jewish property. Of course, we were not driven into the sea. And those people became homeless. None of the Arab countries would give them a home. Only two would even let them in, and they confined them to refugee camps. They are the only people in history to remain refugees after 30 years. Now, David Ben-Gurion was the first prime minister of Israel, and he appointed me to his cabinet as minister of labor. So, I needed an assistant. And a lady named Lou Kadar applied for the job. I speak English, French even better. I was born in France. How are you at writing letters? Oh, would you like to see a sample? I read that a Steve Doring company executive just died. You might want to send a letter of condolence. What a beautiful letter. Did you know this man? Yes, actually. Was he as much of a saint as you say? Hitler? He was a son of a bitch. Okay. You might be very good at this job. Do you think you'd like working with me? I would love it. How do you know that you'd love it? I was with the Haganah. I, I was wounded. I haven't worked since I got out of hospital. Madam Minister, I'm tired of being hungry all the time. That's a good answer. All right, as far as I'm concerned, the job is yours. But I have to check with Ben-Gurion before it's definite. Oh, will that be a problem? Absolutely not. No problem at all. What's the name again? Kada, Lou Kada. Never heard of him. Her. The point is not whether you've ever heard of her. Correct. The point is you don't need her. I'm sending you a very fine man. He's been liaison to the Zionist office in Geneva. He can not only write you effective speeches in Hebrew, but also in English, and French, and Spanish. Plus, he's a very great administrator. He'll make your office run like a watch. His name is Rottenberg. Well, you seem to be very enthusiastic about him. I am enthusiastic about him. Fine. You take Rothenberg for your assistant, I'll take Luke Kadar for mine. Israel had peace, or what was hoped would be peace, and with it, a tidal wave of immigrants. Jews, not only from Europe, but from Arab countries, from Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, Yemen, The Minister of Labor had to find them jobs. Shalom, Mr. Friedenbaum. Oh, How is it going? Well, Madam Minister, you have to understand that these men have held a brick or a cement block in their hands before. Mm. I do, of course. We depend on you to teach them. Well, they, they learn quickly. But I have a problem. Yes. In my group, there are ten men. And I speak only six languages. <laughs> to Golda personally, 
peace meant a little more time for everyday things, such as washing her hair as often as she liked. She also had a tea kettle that was never shiny enough for her. She told me she enjoyed polishing it when she was alone. If she felt lonely, she'd polish twice as hard. But as a cabinet minister, Golda had too many concerns to be alone very often. One developed from a visit to Israeli kibbutzim by United States Senator Hubert Humphrey. I must say I am impressed by what these teachers are accomplishing with retarded children. As you know, I have a particular interest in special education because of a grandchild. Yes, so I understand, Samuel. Uh, may I ask you uh, another question, possibly a little sensitive? Certainly. What about these young couples living together who aren't married? Would you like to sit down, Senator? Personally, I never thought much about it. To me, the main thing would be if people love each other. Oh, Mrs. Meyerson, the main thing is the children. The children? Of course. What happens to the children of those couples? Are they accepted by your society or are they stigmatized? Are they legally legitimate or are they bastards? I don't think it's much of a problem for us. Why isn't it? Couples that aren't married tend not to have children. But that problem is even worse. Your country needs to increase its population, doesn't it? And a whole sector of your strongest and healthiest young people refuses to help. Senator, you're absolutely right. Look, we know who we are and what our commitment is. We don't need a piece of paper to tell us. You love each other. You have a commitment to each other. What is so wrong being married to each other? Nobody says there's anything wrong with it. But nobody's going to push us into it. Push you into it? Who would ever do such a thing? Let me ask you, do you like this room you're living in? Mm, not very much. I thought not, huh? Too close to the chickens. <laughs> would you like to be assigned a room near the flowers? Of course we would. I can arrange that. Oh, what about that ice box running all over the floor? I'm sure you wouldn't mind an electric fridge. I can arrange that too. What's the catch? Catch? No catch. All I ask in return is something you yourself say nothing is wrong with. Get married. Would you come to the wedding, Golda? She went to many weddings and also to a funeral. In 1951, her husband Morris died. I remember thinking, as though it weren't too late to tell him, Dear Morris, I loved you so in those early days. Things changed for us. But in a way, they stayed the same. I never lost that feeling for you, never. I thought how he loved our children and they adored him. I thought, Maurice, at least we can be glad that Sarah's marriage is working out so much better than ours. But mainly, I kept thinking how very sad he was the last years of his life and I was guilty because I could always get him to do pretty much what I wanted. But I couldn't be the wife that he wanted and should have had. In the end, whatever I was able to accomplish, he paid for. Shalom. Maurice. Golda was Israel's labor minister for seven years, doing what she loved best, working with people to provide the solid things that people needed, like housing, and some of the things that turn a desert into a homeland, like trees. During that time, I suppose I became the typical doting Jewish grandmother. 
Some people said I was trying to make up for not having been a doting Jewish mother to my own children. <laughs> well, I suppose they were right. Anyway, between the joy that the children gave me and the satisfaction of doing my job, these were beautiful years, the best of my life. With the coming to power of Colonel Gamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt, the end of Golda's beautiful years was inevitable. From bases around Israel's borders, Nasser sent terror squads called Fedayeen to stage indiscriminate attacks. Such is the killing of six children and their teacher in an agricultural school. The official Cairo radio made Nasser's intention clear. Weep, O Israel. The day of your extermination draws near. We have found the way to strike you. There will be no more arguments at the United Nations. There will be no peace. We demand the death of Israel. And violence even found its way into the Israeli parliament. saved Ben-Gurion's life that day. For the rest of her life, she carried shrapnel in her leg. So, I can believe what they told me. You're all right. I'll be back in the office tomorrow, if I live. If not, I'll be back the day after. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Golda, speaking of living, I didn't want to mention this while your husband was alive, but you still haven't taken a Hebrew name. Well, I see no reason to change Meyerson. It's policy, Gold. You know well that every member of the government is expected to have a Hebrew name, and especially someone with your high visibility outside Israel, which is going to be even higher. What is this now, BG? Moshe Sharet is leaving the cabinet to become secretary general of the Labour Party. Who is going to be foreign minister? You? No. I can't believe you mean such a thing. I certainly mean it. No, no. No, in the first place, I don't want to leave the Labour Ministry. That's my kind of work. Not a foreign ministry is full of sophisticated intellectuals with Oxford and Cambridge education. How could I fit in with them? You will make them fit in with you. I know you will. You know, uh, when somebody asked me how I could make a woman my foreign minister, you know what I said? I said, Golda, he's the best man in my cabinet. Excuse me, BG, if I'm not wild about the, the compliment. Fine, don't be wild, but don't be your stubborn self either. You're taking over as foreign minister and that's that. I am stubborn, huh? Now, about changing your name. I thought of a name that's very close to Myerson. Meir. It's a fine old Hebrew word that means it means to illuminate, to, to shed light. Golda Meir, golden light. You should give this your most serious consideration. Anything else I should do? Yes, you must understand that it is not in my nature to make a fuss about what you did for me as much as I appreciate it. Don't you think I know that? And another thing, there must be no argument about it. You've got to take a little better care of yourself. Don't be in such a hurry to, to come back to work. Or go and spend some time in a nice hotel on the seashore. Rest. Relax. Let your leg heal. Caesarea is a nice place. No argument, B. Jean. I'll do exactly as you say. A week should be more than enough. Almost as soon as Golda Meyerson became Golda Meir, Israel's second foreign minister, 
She had the problem of Israel's second war. The Arab leaders had never accepted peace. Egypt's President Nasser had nationalized the Suez Canal and closed it to Israeli ships. And he was staging a massive military buildup with weapons supplied by the Soviet Union. On October 29, 1956, under the command of Chief of Staff Moshe Dayan, the Israeli army, mostly reservists, crossed into the Sinai Peninsula. They took the Gaza Strip, plus the entire Sinai, in less than a hundred hours. But military victory turned into political defeat at the United Nations. Israel came under intense pressure to withdraw. And in response to United Nations guarantees of freedom of navigation for Israeli ships, and all shipping in the Gulf of Aqaba, and an end to terrorist raids. My government is prepared to announce plans for a full and prompt withdrawal from the Sinai and the Gaza Strip. Now, may I add a few words to the neighbors of Israel? Can we, from now on, all of us, turn over a new leaf? Can we act like sisters and brothers should? Instead of fighting each other, can we fight poverty, disease, illiteracy? Hatred has never made one child in your countries happier. The implements of death has never converted a hovel into a house. Isn't, Isn't it possible, possible that we could put all our efforts, our energies into one single purpose, the betterment of all our lands and all our people through the blessings of peace? There was some polite applause, but not from the Arabs. So I knew we were making a mistake to withdraw. There would be no peace. Our soldiers who were killed and wounded had only bought us a little time, and we would have to fight again. Thank you, Thank Mr. President. President. In the 1960s, there was only one woman foreign minister in the world, and almost anybody in the world could tell you her name was Golda. Golda traveled to the capitals of Europe, to the United States and Canada, to Latin America, Japan, the Philippines, Burma, Ethiopia, and other places. I traveled with her, and I believe she felt that of all the continents, she was able to accomplish the most in Africa. Golda set up a program for thousands of Africans to come to Israel to study subjects like hydrology and agriculture. And thousands of Israeli doctors, engineers, and technical specialists were sent to Africa. Mrs. Mayor, my question is, why is Israel going to the considerable expense of this program? Israel is a small and poor nation that has learned some hard lessons about economic and social development. We feel the responsibility to share what we've learned with other small and poor nations. Mrs. Mayer, that sounds very nice. But I am from Algeria. Your country is being armed by France. That government is fighting a brutal and ruthless war against our people. How do you justify your intimacy with a power that's the enemy of self-determination for the African people? Our neighbors are out to destroy us. They get up-to-date weapons from the Soviet Union, free of charge. Most of our friends, for whatever reason, won't sell us arms. 
the only country that will sell to us and for a lot of hard currency, let me tell you, is France. If President de Gaulle was the devil himself, I would expect my government to buy from him what we need to defend ourselves. And if you were in my position, sir, what would you do? Madam, at least you live up to your publicity, which says that you are honest. <laughs> <laughs> We don't know where they're taking you. Don't worry, Abby. Mrs. Cadell, maybe they let a woman in that hut. I mean, how do we know what they may do to her? From Kiev and Pinsk and Milwaukee. <laughs> what happened? I'm now a member of the secret society of the Zoe Tribes women. I'm the only foreign woman they have ever admitted. <laughs> oh, you I must have a photograph of my grandchildren. Oh, yes, we'll take a picture, but uh, what went on in that hut? Oh, it is a secret society. It was a secret ceremony. I'll never tell. <laughs> And she never did. And then, do you know what he wanted? Are we still talking about Idi Amin? Yes, yes, Idi Amin, the Meshuggah. <laughs> when I told him I couldn't give him six fighter planes, he asked for 10 million pounds sterling. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and well, then he threatened to go to the enemy, meaning Libya. <laughs> I should have handled it better, but... <laughs> Goldie, you never chat. Hmm? What? Chat. Small talk. Especially at a dinner like this, you never do. Oh, you want to chat, huh? <laughs> no. Chat. Chat. Well, you, you know that uh, Gabby wants a divorce. I think if uh, she has a chance to be happy with somebody else, by all means, she should take this chance. I think we should have the same chance. Golda, after the divorce, would you marry me? Hmm? <laughs> now, this isn't fair. You say chat. Is this a subject for chatting? Compared to Idi Amin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I must sleep on it. I must wash my hair and think. Oh, we both have such important work. Golda, stop. But thinking being about married work. would interfere. Isn't it too late for us anyway? Start thinking about yourself for a change, hmm? before it really is too late. Hello? 
Oh, good morning, Lou. Oh, beautiful day, huh? No, it won't be too hot. It'll be just perfect. Listen, Lou, dear. Will you have my car brought a little early this morning? I have a breakfast appointment with the... with someone. Hmm? 7.30. Fine. Thank you. Mrs. Mayor, my name is Kedem. I'm the manager of the apartment building. Yes. Uh, Mr. Ariel introduced us once. Yes, yes, I know you, Mr. Kedem. But uh, what happened? We don't know yet. Mr. Ariel asked his aide for a wake-up call, but he didn't answer. So I went up and opened the door. It looked like he must have died soon after he went into the apartment. After the death of Ariel, Golda seemed to be trying to bury herself in work. I thought she might succeed, but she collapsed a few times from what was obviously exhaustion. I finally got her to go for a checkup by the same kind of gentle persuasion she used on her cabinet colleagues. I swore up and down, if she didn't, I'd quit. Those lumps don't mean anything, do they? They do. They do. No, let's see her. What you have, according to the biopsy, is a disease of the lymphatic system called lymphoma. Malignant lymphoma. Malignant, I understand. It'll spread. Eventually, it penetrates the other systems. How much longer do I have? Oh, it's not a rapidly metastasizing condition. I'd say you have a good few years ahead of you. Well, I'm 66. How long can I expect to live, anyway? But the question is, those few years, 
Will they really be good or will I be suffering? There's very little pain associated with this disease, Mrs. Mayer. There'll be no real suffering for most of its cause. What about my mind? Your mind? I don't want to live one minute after my mind isn't clear. Your mind won't be affected. What must I do? Practically nothing. Your motor and sensory abilities are not impaired, so we won't go in for heavy chemotherapy this time. Just a few simple drugs. Drugs? What drugs? Well, listen, doctor, I'm a person who can't even take aspirin. We'll discuss each one as we come to it. Will they make my hair fall out? One or two, I possibly... No, no, absolutely not. No, I don't care. I won't take any drug that will make me lose my hair. All right, all right. If you feel that way, we'll avoid those medications and go to different ones. Good. And I'll trust you. On one condition. If anything about this is ever going to be told to anyone, I will choose who and when. Otherwise, it is a strict secret between you and me. Is that agreed, Dr. Lander? Agreed, Mrs. May. Oh, another thing. Yes. Would it hurt you to call me gold, I like everybody else? Well? Well, it's what you said. A slight case of exhaustion. That's all? You're not satisfied with your own diagnosis? All right. It's also complications with the shrapnel in my leg. What are you going to do about that? Retire. Again, Golda, when? Why shouldn't I? Because you'd be bored to death. Come on, Golda. Can you see yourself out of politics? Much less retired? Yes, I can see myself with books that I've been wanting to read. Go to the theater, to a movie. I like the movies, you know. I can see myself with my grandchildren, spending time I never could with my children. Always looking at my watch. Do I have to go the way I'm forever rushing now? Why not, Loom? Because Ben Gurion is retiring. That's enough of a loss for the country for a while. They say that Levieshko will replace him, is that right? Probably. What will you do if uh, Levi Eshkel asks you to stay on, which he certainly will? How can you desert a brand new prime minister of your own party? It's uh, less than two years to the next elections. I suppose if Eshkel needs me, I'll stay that long. But not longer. Time is precious to me now. Golda stayed on the two years, then resigned, and was succeeded as foreign minister by Abba Ibn. But her retirement didn't last long. From commanding positions on the Golan Heights, Syrian artillery had been shelling Israeli villages across the border below. One of the worst attacks was on the kibbutz of Gadot in the spring of 67. Golda, come this way. This way. Please. Twenty people died in here. Plus the people in five houses that were hit by shells. Plus the kindergarten building and two nurseries. Total stop. casualties. Let's go stop. This ambulance is ready to go. Send another ambulance up here. Why? Why did I have to see this? I'm retired. I'm a private citizen. It was bad enough to hear it on the radio. Why did you send the car for me? Because I want you to have a clear picture of what's happening here. I want you to hear it from Diane. Golda, in addition to the threat from Syria, Jordan is filling up with Iraqi forces, including 
planes and pilots. The King of Jordan just placed his forces under the command of an Egyptian general. Egypt now has got troops along our border, as in 56, and more tanks, Golda. There is a very big difference. This time, there are the United Nations troops between as a buffer. Nasser ordered the UN out, Golda. They, they won't leave. The UN gave us guarantees. They are leaving. Our observation planes spotted them at first light this morning. The UN is moving out. As soon as they are gone, Nasser will close the straits and choke off Elat again. He says so. If we accept all this, we might as well cut our throats. Tell me what I can do. Come back to work, Golda. Well, Abba Eben is running the foreign ministry very well. I am not saying run the foreign ministry. I am saying run the party. We're splitting at the seams with all our differences. If you were secretary general, you could unite the party like nobody else. What do you say, Golda? Of course. Hello. Kibbutz Revivim. Oh, Golda, what's the situation? Can you tell us anything? Shlomo, what can I tell you? Everybody that isn't mobilized is out in the parks digging trenches. I've never seen such tension in my life. Can I speak to my daughter? Sarah? Sarah is out in the desert, feeling sandbags. But she's okay? She's feeling fine? She's fine. And the children, have they had enough drills? Do they know to run to the shelters? They know, they're well trained. Listen, Golda. Is the government considering that the best thing might be to sit tight and wait? Wait for what? For Russia to send the Arabs more tanks? Yesterday the Arab radio said, quote, the aim is to wipe Israel off the map. Today they told Diane that they would put out his other eye. Should we wait for them to come and do it? We didn't wait. On the following Monday morning, the six-day war began. In the first three hours, Israeli planes knocked out almost the entire Egyptian air force. In the first three days, Israel took the Gaza Strip and the entire Sinai. It was the 1956 campaign all over again, but with differences. This time, Israeli soldiers took the concrete bunkers of the Syrians on the Golan Heights. And when King Hussein of Jordan joined the Arab attack, Israel took all of Jordanian-held Palestine, including the old city section of Jerusalem. After 19 years, Jews were able to visit their holiest site, the Western Wall. Now remember thinking, we have defensible borders again. Is there anyone who would dare tell us to give them up again without a real guarantee of peace? And go home and start preparing our nine and ten year olds for the next war. No. No, not this time. I'm new in this route. Welcome to my bus. Well, what are you doing? Golda Meir shouldn't have to carry groceries. Oh, Golda Meir can carry groceries like anybody else. Oh, I'm a private citizen again, thank God. I'm sure he doesn't know it yet. Wait till he finds out.
You still live in that little house on Baron Here Street? Mm, yeah, now I can enjoy it. I'm taking you to your door. Oh, no, Mr. Lazar. No, please, you're not allowed. Uh-uh. I am capable of walking home from the bus stop. You too tired from shopping? I'm not tired. Well, I'm tired from the thought of letting you walk. If you're tired, then drive yourself home. <laughs> OK. Will the cabinet give me a vote of confidence to drive Golda home? you must feel, but some of us were just at the Knesset. And everybody is saying there's only one solution. Golda must come back. What are you talking about? You don't know. What? Levi Eshko. He had a heart attack. And he's dead. My dear God! Eshko! Mrs. Mayor, would you be willing to take over as Prime Minister? I don't even know what you're saying. Please leave me alone. But, but Mrs. Mayor, we must all Everybody seems to feel you're the only one who could unite the country. Eshko said I was the only one who could unite the party. Now it is the whole country. Oh, I came here to live on a kibbutz and help to build a homeland in a plain and simple way. I don't want to be prime minister. Golda, if you don't take the job, the leading contenders will practically fight a civil war over it. That's all we need. It's enough the Arabs insist they're still at war with us. Well, who knows if I would be elected anyway. I'm a 70-year-old grandmother. No matter. You're in good health, right? Well, being 70 is no joke. <laughs> but it's no sin either. I did enjoy my retirement. Yeah. The hell you did. She was elected by a vote of 70 to nothing. Some of our friends in other countries have expressed concern that Israel, by maintaining strong armed forces, may become, may become militaristic. militaristic. I can I only answer, answer that I'm not, not in favor of a of nice, nice, liberal, anti-militaristic and, and dead, dead Jewish, Jewish people. people. On the other yeah, hand, the, the victories that we have won have never intoxicated us. They've never made us forget our great hope, our great desire, which is for peace. A peace that means good neighborly relations with the Arab people is fundamental for the Jewish Renaissance. With all my heart, I pledge that this government will make every effort in its power to bring about a true and enduring peace. <laughs> In October, Golda accepted President Nixon's invitation to visit the United States. There was a spit and polish ceremony watched on television in Israel with great pride. Madam Prime Minister and our guests here at the White House today, the problems of the Mideast are terribly complex and not susceptible to solution in one meeting or two meetings or three meetings or even more at the level at which we will be talking. We know that your neighbors want peace. How do you like my Golda, huh? His Golda. <laughs> I think your father is falling in love. I would. We shall have discussion. But what a line I'd have to stand in. <laughs> in Jerusalem, 
Her typical day would begin in the office and continue at home. Often she would meet with one group of cabinet ministers in the kitchen over an international problem. And at the same time with other ministers in the dining room over a domestic problem. She was supposed to go to bed by midnight. It didn't always happen. Lou, come and get me. Did you order the white coats? Yes, I ordered the white coats, but what's the point of all this secrecy? Suppose it does come out that your leg is bothering you, what of it? No politicians have a way of blowing things out of all proportions. Do you feel better now? What we have to do now is to go into the therapy we have already discussed. I have arranged for it to begin now. No. Ah, oh, Golda. Let's not have you be intransigent about it. Put it on. Everybody puts coats on. May I ask why, Mrs. Mayor? She looked like doctors in a hospital. Four doctors attract less attention than four ex-paratroopers. And Lou, please don't worry. Don't worry. Either that or you stay here. Put the coats on. You look very nice, Avi. Your mother always wanted you to be a doctor, didn't she? treatments uh, twice a week. I have arranged them for after midnight. And if there are leaks? We are treating you for the shrapnel in your legs. Remember, it makes my hair fall out. Just one hair. This is a very important man. 
He holds the key vote on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Friendly or not friendly? Well, said to be a friendly type, uh, personally. On Israel, however, not sympathetic. Never has been. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. I am Simcha Dinitz, Mrs. Mayor's political secretary. Glad to meet you. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. Madam Prime Minister, how do you do? And I'm very happy to meet you, Senator. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Would you care for a coffee? Yes, thank you. And uh, a little something to go with it? Are you hungry? No, coffee's fine, thank you. What's she doing out there? Making coffee. You mean herself? And if I know her, a little something to go with it. Excuse me. Madam Prime Minister, the cake looks good. Mm, my own recipe. Uh -huh. You see, no one is ever hungry. But when I serve honey cake, they don't refuse. There, sit down. There. I'll try some of my apricot jam with it. There, I'll just bring this out to the boys and I'll be right back. Mm. If you don't like the menu, it's your own fault. I told you to go home. Golda, you know we have to be relieved. I don't need anybody today. I won't be going out anymore. Golda, we have our orders. And I won't tell anybody. I promise. <laughs> I don't know when anything hit the spot quite like that. Can I help you with these dishes? You can help me, Senator. But not with the dishes. Well, in addition to the Starfighter, I think we can get congressional approval to sell the M5... The Starfighter is not the plane we need. What's wrong with it? The Egyptians are flying Russian MiG-21s with a speed of 1380 miles per hour comparable to the Starfighter. And it has a range of 680 miles, better than twice the Starfighters. Also, the Starfighter is an unstable airplane with an unacceptable record of crashes. We can't afford to lose pilots in combat, let alone in accidents. No, the plane we need is the Phantom. Let's talk tanks. The Egyptians have the Russian T-62, an excellent tank. It's faster than your M551 Sheridan and it has heavier armor. But the Sheridan has a heavier cannon. Yes, but the Sheridan is too light for the recoil of such a heavy cannon. It shakes the laser rangefinder out of enlightenment. And also the Sheridan has a blind spot at the range of 1,000 to 1,200 yards. Oh, Senator. Sell us the M60. My dear lady, how do you keep up on all this? Oh, sad. Don't you think I'd rather be up on schools, housing, farming, industry? But we have no choice. After the Six Day War, we pleaded with the Arabs to negotiate peace. And they came back with our famous three no's. No negotiation, 
No recognition of Israel. No peace. And the situation of the PLO is that Israel must be destroyed, even within its pre-war boundaries. I don't think the United States will ever let that happen. Hmm. Oh, you remind me of your wonderful President Kennedy. May he rest in peace. He said to me, Mrs. Mayer, nothing will happen to Israel. We are committed to you. And I said to him, Mr. President, I believe you 100%. I just want to make sure that by the time you honor your commitment, we are still there. All right, what about the recipe for your honey cake? Egyptian build-up is along the full length of the Suez Canal. It amounts to 100,000 men and over 2,000 tanks. And what do we have? Without calling up the reserves? 8,500 men. 276 tanks. The Syrians have 45,000 men against our 5,000. 1,700 tanks against our 176. What does intelligence say? We don't see the Syrians attacking us. We think they somehow got the idea we may attack them. And the uh, Egyptian build-up? If Nasser was still alive, we'd be concerned. But Anwar Sadat is a cooler head. Sadat simply has his army on maneuvers. And nobody thinks we should call up the reserves? Is this because nobody wants to upset the country three days before Yom Kippur? Well, it is not a matter of Yom Kippur, Gonda. Our best intelligence, including input from the Americans, is uh, there will be no war. What do I know about it anyway? My instincts tell me to mobilize. But the facts are that it would cost millions and just about triple industry, business, essential services. So how can I follow my instinct? Especially when the best military minds in the country advise against it. No, oh, Lou, I must be getting old. Advice never stopped me before, but it wasn't only the general staff. We had a cabinet meeting. And the vote was against mobilization, unanimously. So, Toots, there you are. Excuse oh. me, this just came. Oh, thank you, Avi. Go to your family. Yom Kippur will, will soon be here. Shalom. Shalom. Another intelligence report. Soviet transport planes are in Syria, evacuating the families of Russian military advisors. This does not alter our current assessment of the situation. On the eve of Yom Kippur, the most sacred of all Jewish holidays, Many Jews traditionally have a family dinner before the fast begins. This year, I just couldn't sit at the table. I left early and went to bed. Yes? Golda, this is Talmi, Army Intelligence. We have reliable information that Syria and Egypt will both attack this afternoon. 
They have amassed troops and aircraft on the Golan Heights and near the Suez Canal. Have you informed Ayan and Dado? Yes. They've made a staff decision to call up reserve units for the defense line immediately. Every man in the country between the ages of 18 and 55 will be called. They say they need your approval for the next phases. And how soon can they meet you in your office? How soon? For the moment, all I could think was, I will never forgive myself. I should have overruled the cabinet and everybody else and mobilized yesterday. But it was a little late for that. I'm on my way. The first decision concerns calling up additional units at this time. Call them up. On the next point, the defense minister and I are not in agreement. Golda, our Air Force can strike at noon if you give me the green light. That would be a preemptive strike. I'm against it because we'll get us labeled the aggressors. Three brilliant generals and I have to decide. Yes, because this is not a military issue. It is strictly political. Dada, I know that your approach can save lives up front. But we don't know about the future. Suppose it turns out that we need help. If we strike first, we'll get nothing from anyone. No preemptive strike. That's it. At 2 p.m. on Yom Kippur Day, the Syrians shelled Israeli positions and then attacked. In the south, the Egyptians crossed the Suez Canal along its entire length. The first three days of fighting threatened disaster for Israel. The Egyptian army overran Israel's strong points on the renowned Barlev line. Their armored columns raced toward the critical desert passes. In the north, the situation was even worse. The Syrian army broke through on the Golan Heights, heading for the farm settlements below. Yes, Golda. Well, has the airlift started? Uh, not yet. What do you mean, not yet? You should have seen our kids going off to the front, not knowing they may have no air cover. I'm aware of that. Oh, Simcha. You can't imagine how... how actually frightening the situation is. We have already lost almost half of our fighter planes. No, not in air battle, but to missiles. Russian missiles against us on both fronts. And our tank losses are just as bad. Kolda, the Defense Department does not want to send us arms in U.S. cargo planes. I'm shopping around for other... It's too late for shopping. President Nixon promised to help us if we needed help. Tell him we do. And it has to be today. Tomorrow, we may be completely overrun. Call Kissinger and tell him. Call the senator who liked my cake. Call them right now. Golda, do you know what time it is here? I'm not sleeping, God knows, but they are. Tell Kissinger he can sleep when the war is over. Richard Nixon kept his promise. He personally ordered C-5 galaxies to deliver tanks, rockets, and medical supplies. The fighter planes, denied permission to land in any of the European democracies for refueling, were refueled in flight. And on the ninth day of the war, the airlift reached Israel. Our losses were devastating. But rearmed by the airlift, Israeli forces took the offensive. I 
remember thinking, thank God, we rejected the temptation to strike first. Yes? Dardo! Where are you? The canal! With Shaka's division. Oh, don't be such a hero. You're the chief of staff. You're supposed to be in the map room. Diane and I are just looking things over. Listen, Golda. Can you hear me? Yes? We're back to being ourselves. And they are back to being themselves. And Golda, it will be all right. On this tenth day of the war, I can tell you we have a task force across the canal operating in the Egyptian territory. I want to express our deep gratitude to the president and the people of the United States. By the 16th day, Israel had retaken virtually all of the Sinai, held a large area across the canal, and had the Egyptian Third Army completely encircled. In the north, Israel had regained all of the Golan and moved into Syria, within 25 miles of Damascus. At this point, the Soviet Union began pressing for a ceasefire. And at kilometer 101 in the Sinai Desert, at a meeting arranged by the United Nations, an armistice was signed. But in spite of the military victory, the mood in Israel was bleak and bitter. Battle casualties were the heaviest since the 1948 War of Independence. A kind of national trauma set in. My son, when you called him up, he ran off in such a hurry, he forgot his dog tags. So if he's dead, how will I ever know? My son took his drugs. Why don't I know? If he's dead, where is his body? If he's not dead, if he's a prisoner, why can't anybody tell me? We are getting a prisoner of war list from the Egyptians very soon. That's the agreement. From the Syrians, I don't know. They won't agree even to that. Every one of us was in the fighting. We saw our friends die next to us. We have the right to ask. Just when we had the enemy on the run, why did you agree to that ceasefire? I wanted to hold out for a true negotiated peace this time. I have spent my life pleading for peace. We are a very small country with a great and powerful friend. Sometimes we have to give in to that friend, even when we don't want to. We blame you for the war because the country wasn't prepared. You should resign, and so should he. Defense Minister Dayan offered to resign three times. I insisted that he stay. Murderers! Murderers, both of you. Do you want to know what I tell my children? I tell them you killed their father. Do they think we don't care? There is no way to fight a war without losses, especially when the other side suddenly attacks. The Americans had Pearl Harbor, the French the Maginot Line, the British Dunkirk. Those people seem to understand. Those people are not like our people. Do you think, Diane, that's why God chose us? I've told my key people I would die. I better mean it this time. Isn't that right, Hein? Yes, yes, I suppose so. Well, I'm ready. I've done about everything I had hoped to. And got yourself voted woman most admired in America. 
You couldn't have planned on that. Woman most admired. <laughs> Would Morris have voted for me? You know, if I had my life to live over, Maybe there is something I would change. I think I would have stayed on the kibbutz. But what would the country have done without you? No, oh, believe me, Israel would have come through anyway. And I would have been more at peace with myself. My whole life. Why did you decide not to be a prime minister anymore? Well, there was a number of reasons. But one of them was, I was beginning to imagine that people around me were whispering, for God's sake, when is this old woman going to make up her mind? That it's time for her to leave. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't all imagination. <laughs> You never wanted to be a prime minister, did you? Right. I became one, just like my milkman became a commander of a machine gun squad in the 73 year. Believe me, he didn't want that job. But somebody had to do it. You think there will ever be peace between Israel and those other countries? Yes. I believe. We must believe that there will be peace someday. When will that be? When? Well, I can tell you. When the Arabs love their children more than they hate us. That's when peace will come. call was from Dennis. They want you to cancel the rest of your trip and come home. Who's they? Everybody. What everybody? How about your friends and your enemies? <coughs> Golda, Sadat is coming to Jerusalem. Begin is going to meet him at the airport and bring him to address the Knesset. Sadat is actually coming? Not just talking about it? I'm not in the government. Now, what do they need me for? Need you? It's history. You're part of it. Oh, I'm ancient history. But if Sadat really wants to talk peace, I'd like to see somebody try to keep me away. I have chosen this difficult road, which is considered by many, and in the opinion of many, the most difficult road. I have chosen to come to you with an open heart and an open mind. I have chosen to present to you and in your own home the realities devoid of any scheme or whim, not to maneuver or win a round, but for us to win together. The most dangerous of rounds and battles in modern history, the battle of permanent peace, based on justice. This wonderful step the President Sadat has taken by coming here proves 
that speaking to each other through middle persons is not the same as meeting face to face. On our differences about the Palestinians, I believe there is a solution in a peace treaty with Jordan that will be good for them and safe for us. And now, I want to say something to President Sadat. As an old lady, <laughs> I would say this. <laughs> you always called me the old lady. You know? As an old lady, my great hope is to live to see the day of peace between you and us between all our neighbors and us. And as a grandmother to a grandfather, <laughs> although you are just a new grandfather, I have a little gift for your granddaughter. Let us hope that through our genuine efforts in Geneva, we can uh, uh, bridge the rift that has taken place between us and uh, 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 establish peace once and for all on the two main points that I have mentioned to you now. Security and um, no more war. Whatever happens between us, we must sit and solve through peaceful negotiations. Again, I must not end my words without thanking Mrs. Mayer for this kind gesture. Let us hope that the peace process that we have started, Mrs. Mayer and me, will continue and flourish and will uh, give satisfaction to every girl, every woman, every man in Israel and the Arab world. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Ahmoud M. Hamdi, Deputy Foreign Minister of Egypt. President Katsir, President Sadat, Prime Minister Mr. Gbegin, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. How exciting to be here in the holy city of Jerusalem at such an important time in history. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to present to you the President of Israel, His Excellency Ephraim Katsir. By the time they get to you, are you going to remember what you wanted to say? Did you ever know me when I didn't have something to say? As we stand on the threshold of peace, we pray for wisdom. And now, it is my privilege to present a truly great lady of our time, or any other time. She has been called the Mother of Israel, the Earth Mother of her people. But mostly, she is called Golda. Ladies and gentlemen, Golda Meir.
Well, if I'm supposed to be the mother of Israel, earth mother or whatever kind of mother, I have the responsibility to be a good one. And what a good mother would say to you now is, it's late, everybody's tired, go home. <laughs> Mr. President, I say good night. Good night, dear lady. I hope we see each other again soon. I'm glad you came. I'm glad too. Very glad I came. So, let me ask, what took you so long? A lot of people said and wrote a lot of things about her, such as, the miracle of Golda was that she embodied the spirit of so many people, the hopes, fears, ideals, and stubbornness of Jews everywhere. But as usual, Golda said it better. Why am I known? Because of my wisdom, my great achievements, no. I'm known because at the time of struggle for the Jewish people, I was one of a group that made it possible to have what we have, what we've been able to defend by the skin of our teeth. I did what I thought was right, and that's that. And after me, someone else will come, and I hope they'll do better. Shalom. Gold up.